Hello there, my name is John Beethan, and I support Teresa Acosta for Carlsbad City Council District 4, and this is why. Um, so I'm the candidate, I'm Teresa Acosta, I'm running for Carlsbad City Council in District 4, that's South Carlsbad, and we have an empty seat on our city council. We have a new district election system, so this is our first time electing through the new district election system. Uh, we've not had a representative on the city council from South Carlsbad for nine years. So we finally are gonna have the ability to elect somebody from South Carlsbad to be our representative at the city council. That means we will get attention and funding for some of our projects that have just fallen off the radar because we've not had anyone to step up and kind of be the squeaky wheel, right? Sometimes that's what you need to get the attention. Uh, and certainly we've had, hello there, we, we've had projects that were on the list and have fallen off mysteriously. So having a champion to stand up for South Carlsbad on the city council is very important. I was asked to run and inspired to run because there are community folks, community leaders that uh, know that I've got a lot of experience working with government agencies. I've spent my entire career, 20 years, working with local governments in California, 20 years of uh, finding ways for government to be more efficient, the last 10 years as a small business owner right here in La Costa, and uh, my business builds public-private partnerships. So I work with government agencies, with nonprofits, with community groups, and with businesses to help find innovative solutions to all kinds of local and regional problems. I know that these skills will, uh, the skills of building these partnerships will benefit Carlsbad, particularly because within that skill set, I have to do a lot of collaboration and bringing people from diverse uh, viewpoints together to move forward, right? So a lot of consensus building with diverse perspectives. And that's something that we need. Carlsbad has experienced some, some standstills and some freezes when it comes to moving forward because of disagreements. And I have the skill set that it takes to move things forward. So uh, certainly my business background reflects that, building public-private partnerships and working in government agencies for 20 years. Beyond that, I do a lot of community service. So I sit on multiple nonprofit boards in Carlsbad and statewide. And then I volunteer regularly. In fact, my daughter and I have been spending like her entire childhood doing volunteer work, whether it was picking up trash with the Surfrider Foundation on our local beaches or serving meals to seniors through the Carlsbad Senior Center or Meals on Wheels. Like this is part of what we do as a family is we get involved, we help out, we help out wherever we can in the community. And this is definitely something that is a bigger step in that direction. Stepping up to run for city council is a hard thing to do, but it, it definitely brings together both my background and experience in working with government and finding solutions to problems and also my commitment to community service and public service. So I'm very excited about running. We've got a lot of momentum behind the campaign. Uh, early on, I was asked, what are my top issues? And I said right away, protecting the environment is huge for me. Number one, I'm an environmentalist. I believe in safe neighborhoods. It's another reason we love Carlsbad. It's clean environment, safe neighborhoods, well-managed infrastructure, and local uh, small business support is really important too. I'm a small business owner, as I mentioned, for the last 10 years, and it's great to have a network of support. But in all of those areas, there are ways that the city can step up and do more. I have them listed on my website, and I also have been uh, working with volunteers to pass out this literature. This is a, a brochure that we've been putting out that has a lot of information. Um, this is all what's on my website, just put into like a glossy little flyer. The website's Teresa Costa.org, so really easy to remember. It's just my name, .org. And on the website, in addition to having the background information about me, like my bio, it has information about my policy recommendations, my priority issue areas, and it also has a, a list of my endorsements. So organizations and individuals like Congressman Levin or Sierra Club that back me, that support me, and that want to work with me in this position on the city council because they know they know me and they know that I will do a good job and that I'm really committed to it. So I'm open to your questions and I definitely want to explore the small business side of things. That's why I'm really glad that among all the more than two dozen house parties and virtual events that we have done, uh, that we're doing one tonight 
with another business owner because I think it's really important to talk about uh, what's happening with small businesses. Because I'm a small business owner, but I'm, I'm a consultant, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a one woman shop. I don't, I, it's more like your IT business, right? So low overhead, like I'm not worried about, like I did have a reduction in my client's um, uh, work by 20%, but it's nothing that's gonna hurt me or like hurt my overall business. It's just a temporary thing. I didn't file for any additional help and, and didn't need it. But I really worry about customer serving or you know, B2C, not B2B. It's the B2C people that I worry the most about, especially restaurants that have to worry about like people are scared to come in and all those other things that you've had to deal with when it comes to sanitation and all the protocol that you had to, uh, to, to go through. So let's, let's definitely talk about that tonight. But I also want to hear what other issues you want to bring up with me tonight. Um, because I want to have a, like a very a full fledged conversation, comprehensive conversation about what issues you care about the most. I can talk in depth about what the city council has done for small businesses in terms of the business loans and uh, moratorium on collecting rent in, for businesses. Um, but uh, let's hear what other what other questions you all have and let's have a, a vibrant discussion. So I don't know all of you and I would love to go around. I do know, um, some of you. So if you don't mind, we'll go ahead and do the self introductions the way that we do during our coffee chats in the morning, which is a quick like 17 second commercial like I am uh, the owner of Acosta and Partners Consulting Company. And you know, I'm a candidate for Carlsbad City Council. And, uh, and tonight I'm here because that's like your prompt. I'm here because I want to know about X issue. So for me, I, I want to know what your questions are and what your issues are so that we can have a, a conversation with each other about what's happening in the community and how we can all take action to improve that situation. Thank you. So I think we've gone all the way around so that everybody got a chance to share what they'd like to talk about and why we're here. Uh, but I want to talk about the top issues that you all have brought up. And I, I was listening for for repeats, right? For things that you were saying, I agree with the person before. Um, so let's start with small business because, because this is being hosted by a small business owner and there's so many small business owners here today, including me. Um, and just to be clear uh, for, for the younger folks, uh, B2B, right? Business to business, um, businesses are having like not as tough of a time, right? As the, the B2C which have the actual customers or clients that are coming to them, um, like uh, the gym owners and the nail salon owners and the cafes, just as Dan was mentioning. Uh, I do wanna say through the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, where I chair both the Government Affairs Committee and the Technology Affairs Committee, where I work with John Beethan, at the Chamber of Commerce, we are really focused on helping um, businesses network and find resources, but there's not a ton that they can do, right? The SBDC is another great place for small business owners to help them access federal monies from the CARES Act, but still, like there's not a ton that they're able to do uh, when unemployment runs out, when the CARES Act funding, every time it runs out, because now we're on our third or maybe fourth uh, re-upping of that money, you know, every time it's not like they're going to help fill out the applications or work with your banks. Like really the onus is upon the business owner to go through that. Really all that the chamber can provide is just information and uh, information about webinars and other places where you could learn. Um, they don't actually offer like consulting or assistance for you. Um, but one thing that we have been doing a lot of is kind of support, more of support uh, information. So we've been talking about how to use different platforms like, like Zoom and others that exist. There are some others that might be better for your business like WebEx or other platforms. I know at the Tech Advisory Committee, we had a presentation just on that. We had a presentation just on CRM, how to use Salesforce or other versions of customer relationship management databases. So other technology tools that will help us to do remote work, right? Because almost everybody who has an office is not, unless they're essential workers, they're, they're having to adapt to uh, working from home at least part of the time. So for me, that's 100% of the time, but for other, other business owners and business professionals that I know, uh, they're going in you know, half days, 
The other element that none of us have brought up, but is very related, and Dan, I know that you're very in sync with this, it's what to do with your kids when you're working, because they're not at school anymore. They're at home, and they need help. And if you've got little ones, as you do, because I saw one, <laughs> um, you know, somebody's got to be there to help them and to ensure that they're going to class online, that they're doing distance learning. And even when the kids start going back, they will be going back uh, through hybrid, there will be hybrid transition times where they won't be going back every single day of the week or maybe not all day as they would have usually. So we're dealing in district four with four different school districts and all four of them have different plans for going back. So we've got San Marcos uh, Unified students in our district. We've got Encinitas Union Elementary. We've got San Diego Union High School District and we've got Carlsbad Unified School District. So four different school districts and uh, it's been very exciting to to get to know some of the candidates for, for these and some of their plans and how they're looking at bringing kids back safely and teachers and getting school safe again. So I've been very engaged with them. In fact, at our last coffee chat, which was on the topic of civility, we had a, a, a school board candidate who came and showed up for a little bit. And he was uh, he, Marlon Taylor. He's running for Encinitas Union Elementary Districts at Elementary School District. So it is interesting to talk with them and to find out their stances on these things. Uh, when it comes to small businesses in Carlsbad, uh, I was phone banking earlier today and someone said, well, what can the city really do? So kind of the opposite of what, Dan, of what you said, she was like, this is in the hands of the federal and state government, isn't it? And I said, no, there's actually action that we can take right here at the city level. You may know that the city of Carlsbad has stashed away a lot of the money that uh, came from development in high growth times. And we've got about 90 million in our economic recovery fund. This is for emergencies. And we were able to set aside 5 million of that to help with small business support during the pandemic. And that went to two different kinds of small business loans. And they're, they're listed on the website, all of the requirements to, to receive one of those loans. But essentially, you have to be a Carlsbad-based business. And they opened it up recently, like after they initially approved the funds, they agreed to also include Carlsbad-based franchisees, so fran franchise owners. So you could be part of a bigger chain as long as you, you had an independently, like somewhat independently operated local franchise in Carlsbad. So those funds are available. There's also the gift card program. So Dan, you might be interested in being a part of that, but uh, it's, it's the idea that you could pre-purchase a gift card and uh, get the cash now, right? Get the funds coming in now and people would use those uh, later. And the city is kicking in some additional funds for that to help supplement um, your, your cost for the gift card. So I would check that out to see if there's something that you might, be, might wanna be involved with there. Um, but definitely the city of Carlsbad has been trying. I, I'm glad to see that they've been trying to work with the chamber and with the Carlsbad Village Association. Of course, there are other businesses that we need to hear from in District 4. And that's why it's so important that we have these kinds of events to hear more, like what is really happening on the ground? How, how can we help? One of the things that's been lacking from the city has been real true public engagement, like finding ways and finding tools to engage people. There are many ways that we can do that. We can do surveys. I know I fill out surveys on the future of housing, on, I did one on the pandemic and small business support. The city does send those out. So if you receive uh, newsletters from the city, you kind of have to go through them and then fill out the survey. They do incorporate that. Of course, they aggregate the data. So it's kind of like 50% of people want this, you know? And so they don't, oh, it's not like your input is separated out. It's, it's really just a percentage or, you know, a statistic when it comes down to what the city is considering. But there are workshops. I went to a budget workshop last year at the city of Carlsbad. It was actually last November. And mind you, this is to determine how the budget, the city of Carlsbad's budget is allocated, right? How the entire pie chart gets allocated. And it was a community public input workshop. 12 people were there, two people 
from District 4. Only two people. I was one, somebody who had already declared that she was running for office. And the other was somebody I had texted, Lance Schulte, from Ponto. And he has a particular agenda, which is to create the Ponto Park. And I support that. And I had texted him earlier and I said, Lance, maybe you want to go to this budget workshop and, you know, plead your cause, like the Ponto Park. So he showed up, but we were the only two people to show up from South Carlsbad. So one of the good things about people becoming so comfortable on Zoom and with you know, remote uh, meetings is that hopefully when we have more public engagement from the city, we will be able to get a bigger audience because more people can attend on Zoom. You don't have to leave your house. You could still be watching your kids or having dinner on the side. I can see some of you are doing that and I've you know, got my water, but I've been to a Zoom happy hour. You know, there's a lot of things that you can do on Zoom or a similar platform to that, that people are comfortable with doing that a year ago, they wouldn't have. They wouldn't have gone to those meetings. They wouldn't have felt comfortable or maybe the city wouldn't have offered that option. So hopefully going forward, even as we begin to have more in-person events again, we maintain additional options like this for people to give their public input because we need to hear your input. So just to go over very briefly one sentence, the city is allocating so far, $5 million in the Small Business Fund and the gift card program. They're also doing the signage, particularly in the village area, but they will be extending it throughout the city for sanitation protocol. And they're working with Visit Carlsbad, which is the, tour, the local tourism nonprofit, to help them uh, have a, like a safe, sanitary, like COVID safe campaign so that we can invite tourists back to Carlsbad and let them know that it's safe here, that everybody's complying with the health order and that they can feel comfortable um, having a staycation here in Carlsbad. So that's like the brief overview of, of the business side of things. Just quickly to, to move over to civility, we did have a coffee, so we have coffee chats every two weeks and we pick topics that have bubbled up from phone banking and various conversations that we have where people say, I really wanna talk about X, Y, or Z. So we've had them on all kinds of things from the Carlsbad Community Gardens. What are they? Where are they? And hint, there are none in South Carlsbad. They're all in North Carlsbad and there's a waiting list of 200 people. So we need more and I support more. Uh, what is Ponto Park? Hint, I support Ponto Park. It's building a park right in front of the ocean rather than dense luxury high rises right at Ponto Park. Uh, another is uh, environmental justice. What is environmental justice? The intersection between social justice and environmental um, uh, precautions. So things that we can do when it comes to cleaning up our air quality and our water, ensuring that we have clean water, that we are doing our land use planning in a way that is equitable. We need to make sure that we're looking at our demographics and communities of color and not just giving all of the polluting refineries and the polluting land use uh, to communities of color, right? Not just uh, redlining is what they call that. So that's environmental justice. We talked about social justice and we talked about um, a little bit of police reform to your point, Josh, uh, but we've had these coffee chats and the very last one that we did recently was on civility. We had a speaker come in who runs an organization called Civity. It's a nonprofit based in Sacramento. They work all over California. And what they do is try to get ahead of negative conversations in the community by building uh, trust, by creating trust between nonprofits in the community. So they're a great organization. Uh, I've known Malka because I used to consult for a, a good governance organization, nonprofit, nonpartisan called California Forward. And it had all of these great uh, ideas about how to make government more transparent and how to engage people more. That's why I talk so much about public engagement because I really believe in it and I've worked in it for such a long time. I think that bringing the community in to hear diverse pers perspectives is very important. And uh, that's how I met Malka. So Malka was our speaker. Uh, we had an excellent conversation. She gave us tips, uh, things to do. I, I know I commented on the brushes with civility, like easy things that you can do in your community to create a more positive atmosphere, like just common courtesy things like, you know, saying hello and looking people in the eye when you're walking a trail or something, you know, giving a friendly nod. Most people do that in Carlsbad. Uh, I found at least pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, at least on my street, I live right on La Costa Avenue and we walk up Levante and we will give like a little wave to the people walking their dog on the other side of the street. And we always cross to the other side of the street because of COVID, right? I know uh, that we've all experienced like a little 
friendliness in that way where people just nod or wave. And some people may have experienced, uh, I, I think Ari, you had an experience where somebody like was jogging and didn't move to the other side of the street or didn't go around you and kind of brushed you. And you were like, what? It's COVID. Why did you like, you were too close. <laughs> you felt like you're- It bubble. was strangely intentional. I don't know why that happened because it has it had never happened before a jogger bumped you yeah so i don't know what that was about but but you're right laura that people are experiencing a lot of stress and mental health uh, issues right now and uh, i know that that leads to to incivility sometimes i recently watched the netflix movie so social dilemma any of you see that yeah so social media can be a really negative influence in our lives because the, the movie lays out how uh, you become more extreme because you are basically plied with people who have similar views to yours and you don't get to see other perspectives. You don't get to see other um, other ideas other than ones that you've already expressed as your own and your, your own friend group. So. Uh, I can see how that creates extremism and it worries me. I think that our common issue here in Carlsbad is our care for Carlsbad, right? So even if we may disagree on some other issues, on some specific issues, we all love living here and we all wanna make sure that it's the best place that it can be. So in some ways, and I'm, I'm an idealist and I'm not gonna let go of it, even though I've been called naive uh, over, you know, throughout my life. And, and now I'm, you know, in my forties and I'm still holding on to that idealism where I think that we can remain civil with each other and we can find ways to get along and move forward. In fact, that is what my business does. Like I build public private partnerships with sometimes totally different points of view on either side of the table and I have to bring them forward. Anybody who's ever done mediation work or arbitration work or seen it uh, knows that it's hard work and it definitely takes great communication skills, but it's possible. It's possible to have amicable resolutions. Uh, not always a win-win-win, but uh, if any of you saw Stranger Things, they, the, the guy says, uh, um, he says, what is compromise? He's like, we're both kind of happy. <laughs> like, you know, you move forward. You're both halfway like, happy, halfway happy. Like, you know, it, it, it's not, it's not necessarily a win-win, but it's not a lose-lose either. So we can sometimes move forward incrementally. And, uh, and I really believe in that. So when it comes to Carlsbad, I, I definitely think that we need to uh, find a way to promote civility. We need to promote uh, focusing on the issues and the things that we all care about. In fact, uh, you know, Facebook, I try not to, to, to attend those forums or view those forums that are known for just being toxic. Like all they do is like complain and find negative things to say about people. So, you know, and some, some of it's just fabricated, like not even true. So you just, you have to pick and choose, like, am I going to get involved and dragged down and brought down by that? Sometimes even individual people in your lives could be a dark cloud and sometimes you just need some distance from it because it doesn't help anybody. Um, so I'm really focused on helping, uh, helping uh, the community stay positive. And I think that in the future, having more forums like this and more conversations where we just put it out there and we say, you know, I'm transparent, ask me any question, like, let's have the conversation. Uh, in one of the forums, we've had two candidate forums, by the way, if you're curious, for those of you who haven't seen them, one was at the Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce, and you can find that right on the front of their website, carlsbad.org. There was a candidate forum, because we've got two races in Carlsbad. One is District 2, that's Keith Blackburn and Leela Panagitis running for that seat, and the other is District 4, and that one's me and my opponent's Phil Urbina. So we've got two races going on, and all four candidates uh, were in this uh, candidate forum. One great thing about the candidate forum was the way it was structured. Like it was not the kind where you could talk over somebody. It was on Zoom. They could mute your mic, you know, if you tried to talk too much. I, it was great because it was very civil. It was, you know, you could see that people uh, had very different viewpoints on some things, um, but you could you could really get a, a flavor for what the candidates 
were expressing and what their viewpoints and philosophies are. So I, I recommend that you check those out, Carlsbad Chamber of Commerce Candidate Forum, and the other is the League of Women Voters. And you know that they are a nonpartisan organization that has a very active role in local governance. And they had a very similar, even more strict rules about uh, not being able to, um, you know, say anything negative about anything the city is doing, but only focus on what we want to do positive for the city. So um, that worked well for me because that's what my whole campaign is about. It's about these are the issues and how can we work on these particular issues. Uh, one of the issues is public safety. So I don't want to forget what you said, Josh, about wanting to address Black Lives Matter. Uh, and definitely uh, um, Black Lives Matter. So those were, there were a couple questions that I was asked outright. Uh, the other question was, do you want to defund the police? No, I do not want to defund the police. What I'm looking for is ways for our community to be more inclusive and more encouraging of diverse communities here within Carlsbad. We have seen that there have been some general uh, cultural issues where people feel like friends of ours who have come to some of our coffee chats who are black have said, I moved to Carlsbad, I moved out after a year or two. Like it just didn't feel, it wasn't welcoming to me or to my family in the schools. And that was just the, the feeling that they had. So we need to get to the root of those issues. When it comes to law enforcement, our uh, law enforcement, Carlsbad PD, we have our own independent police department. They have a really good record. They've been rated by the FBI's, like very highly rated by the Eight Can't Wait uh, organization. Campaign Zero is the organization that created the Eight Can't Wait. Uh, they've been they've been ranked very highly and also our our PD adopted the a can't wait rules before any other San Diego County law enforcement uh, department did and uh, has tried to stick to it we do need to hold them more accountable I am very interested in the idea of a citizens review board and I've been talking about that I have some other ideas when it comes to like general police reform things that we can do in Carlsbad, they mostly relate to training, like sensitivity training, cultural training, understanding the community better, having more of a community policing philosophy. In fact, I was in a conversation with the chief, chief of police and the top city staff like just two weeks ago, and I asked the chief of police his thoughts on community policing, and I, it, the answer was so vague that I felt like he didn't really know what it was. <laughs> And I've worked with a lot of other police departments. Uh, and in fact, I have a good friend who works for the California Department of Justice now. He's the chief of the Law Enforcement Bureau. But he was the chief of police in Gardena, which is a very interesting community that has a very large Latino population, African American population, and Asian population, as well as white. So it's like about, about a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. So it's a very diverse community. He's Latino. He became chief of police very young, like I want to say not even 30 when he became chief of police. And he has really been a star. So now he's at this very high level California Department of Justice position. But when I met him, he was chief of police and he was getting a master's in leadership at USC. So we bonded over the USC tie, right? I went to USC for undergrad and we talked about why he was going back for a master's in leadership. And it was really about having like a very clear plan for how he could, he could organize his community. And he was very open. I interviewed him like three weeks ago, right when I was in conversation with the police officers union here, talking with them. They were asking me a lot of questions as a candidate, what my thoughts were. And I leaned on him, like I, I, I interviewed him before I went in to talk with them and asked him a lot of questions too, like what do you think, uh, what worked in Gardena and what do you think about a community like ours, especially because he's at this high level position statewide now where he oversees all the law enforcement in California for the DOJ, for the state, the California, for the Attorney General, for Javier Becerra. And uh, we talked about citizens review boards and we talked about ways that we could find uh, social workers to supplement our police force or to replace sometimes when officers, rather than have, send out an officer right away, an armed officer with the badge, maybe we should be sending a social worker first and have like a, you know, a trained homeless response team that is not just the, the police officer that has a little bit of homeless training, right? So somebody who's a specialist and an expert in working with the homeless, 
Same for mental health. When we're called out to a mental health call, maybe we should be sending somebody who's a specialist in that, a social worker who knows mental health issues and not just you know an armed police officer. So there are some things like that that we should be considering that we are already considering. I've been watching all the council meetings and I saw um, the council meeting where the, the two council members were really pushing for more accountability and the way that the council is structured right now, it's the, you know, the two women are the ones who are pushing a little bit more. The two men, uh, Matt Hall and Keith Blackburn are not. Keith Blackburn is a former uh, police officer and he remains a volunteer police officer on the force. Uh, it's some weird status that he has. It's like a gray area, like he's retired, but he can go out with the uniform and badge. Um, so there was, there's still some question about how that works. Uh, and then and then the mayor. So the mayor and Keith Blackburn are, are pretty opposed to making reforms. Uh, and the two women are really pushing for it. I am, you know, running for that empty seat, right? So if I get in there, then we're definitely going to see some more questions and, and accountability. We have a, a strong police um, score right now. Like people say that we don't have a lot of incidences of abusive force in Carlsbad. We have a low crime rate. Our top crime in District 4 is petty crime from cars. Uh, so, you know, we're very fortunate here. We're not in a place where we have a lot of murders and violent crimes but we still need to stay on top of these issues. And we need to ensure that our police officers are not acting in a way that is disproportionately harming communities of color, right? This is systemic racism that exists is everywhere. And we need to make sure that we are recognizing it and we're addressing it and we're doing the training that we need to do. Um, this has been a community that has not really um, brought uh, racism or anti-racism to the forefront of any of our conversations. You know, Carlsbad, we, we've just said we're, we're pretty homogeneous and uh, we, we don't have a need for it. It's not true. We're, we're turning away people, great community uh, members that move here and then move away because they don't feel comfortable here. So uh, I would be the first Latina ever to sit on the Carlsbad City Council, and that's exciting to me. It's exciting to bring a diverse perspective of somebody who grew up in, in Pasadena and in LA and, and had an opportunity to, uh, <laughs> as a, I finally saw a chat come through and it was my own daughter's, yay viva, she wrote. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it's, it's exciting to be able to bring uh, a perspective yeah, she just noticed that she sent it. Um, but it's exciting to bring that perspective of uh, being a minority and, and bringing that perspective to the city council. So anyway, I want to open it up for questions. I see more than 22 comments in the chat that I wasn't able to see. And maybe John and Dan, you can help me uh, facilitate the conversation uh, because there may be multiple things in the chat that you saw come up as trends. Yeah, when I when I went through the Carlsbad Citizens Academy about five years ago, uh, the city takes the participants through each department of the city. And there's one evening, you, you go for like two hours from like 5 to 7pm, uh, like four or five sessions. And there was one that was devoted to public safety. And we spent time with all the top brass at the police and the fire departments. We, we walked through and took a tour of the public safety uh, training center. Uh, certainly they spent a lot of money on a very uh, top, top uh, tech, like state-of-the-art uh, public safety training center. Um, they've got a lot of fancy gear, but we really need to focus more on training, like in working with the community. One of the things I talked about with the, the officers when I spoke with uh, some of the officers, the union the other day, I was telling them about my experience in LA uh, starting a neighborhood watch. I invited my local council member's office, right? It was LA. So they had like a staff that came out to my house for coffee and cookies and on the lawn. I invited my beat officer. So the local senior lead officer from LAPD, his name was Marcus Allen. And he's still on my Facebook and he comments and encourages me in running for office to Carlsbad. Mind you, that was like 14 years ago that I did that, but it was about building a relationship and talk about building a relationship and how it actually worked because the, you know, my senior lead officer is still in that position and he's a, you know, a cop in the same place, same beat. And he's, he remains, he remembers who I am. We built a relationship and he's following my career and my life, even though I've been in Carlsbad for more than 10 years now. So it's, uh, it's really about building relationships with your law enforcement and it can be done 
in my area where I live right now, where we've had this house for five years, there is no neighborhood watch. We don't have an HOA and we don't have neighborhood watch. This is old La Costa. And a lot of district four is like this um, because we have a lot of seventies homes uh, and uh, we don't have a neighborhood watch. In fact, I walked up the street before COVID before March, I was doing GOTV literature um, distribution for Mike Levin in my neighborhood. And I met uh, a woman who said she had started the neighborhood watch here. And I said, Oh, I live down the street. I didn't know we had a neighborhood watch. She said, well, I started it, but I actually haven't done anything for like six or seven years. And she said, how long have you lived here? I said, almost five years now in this house. And she said, Oh yeah, that's why I haven't met you before. So, you know, these things fall off the radar, but if we could have the city really push, like every area of the city could, could have a neighborhood watch. They could all have an assigned officer that works that beat. I mean, that's what we did in LA. And mind you, that was LA. Like it was not uh, the world's, you know, best, most sophisticated of everything. We're Carlsbad. We have a lot more funding. We have a lot more, you know, officers with time on their hands because they don't have a lot of gangs or murders around here. And we can work on this kind of community policing. So I would like to see more of that. I, I think we also need to do a lot more PIO work. That's the public information officer that puts out information about what's happening in the city in terms of crime statistics. And, you know, we get these emails. I've signed up for our current PIO, which is really just like a, a communications coordinator. And she sends out notifications that there's a phishing scam or there's a texting scam going around, you know, like the Nigerian bank account scams, you know, or, or she, sometimes she'll say there's been a rash of car break-ins. Don't forget to lock your car and close your garage, even when you're home, you know, those kinds of very basic things. We need to do much more. There's a whole nother league that we are not even near, you know, when it comes to PIO work. Uh, and for example, if there's a helicopter circling above and they're shouting something out in their megaphone, you can't hear what they're saying. A PIO would be responsible for ensuring that that information is available through all the social media channels and, you know, through a website. Uh, a lot of police departments have this. They devote, you know, they invest uh, in, in a person who's a professional with the staff and they make sure that that person is in charge of all the community relationships that the police department has. We don't have that. We have a communications coordinator, Jody Sassaway, sending out the little emails about the, the scams going on. So we can invest in that. I'm very curious and interested to see how we can, how much that would cost, because I don't think it's very much. I think it's very doable. Yeah. Thank you. We actually did a coffee chat specifically on the future of housing as well. And we talked a lot about how we need to build more housing, especially workforce housing to prevent people from one, not being able to come here, but other, uh, the other thing is we have people who are working here that are commuting for two hours to get here from Marietta or Temecula because that's where they can afford to live. I met those people. I know those people. We have neighbors that have moved out there because they could get a bigger, nicer house, but then they're sitting in traffic and they change their minds and they try to come back here and they can't afford, and they'd already sold their home here. They can't afford to come back to Carlsbad because this is where their jobs are. So we definitely need to address housing. We need to address transportation infrastructure. There's so many issues that we can work on because some of these issues are only going to get worse until we do. So we definitely have a lot of work on our hands. I'm very open to having more of these conversations. I know that we have to wrap up because we're past the hour. We're at 610. We're 10 minutes past and many of you have dinner and other things to get to. But I did want to say that we've got some other opportunities to continue this conversation coming up. So the one that we have this Wednesday, October 14th is for Gen Z. Any young people that you know under the age of 25 that would like to talk about issues of concern to them and a lot of them are going to talk about Black Lives Matter. I know because we've done one before. Uh, this was this is our second Gen Z focused event. Um, so we're going to have that on Wednesday. Then we've got another one coming up next Monday. That's uh, a hosted uh, similar to this event There's a neighbor in La Costa Valley, Kathy Dodson who used to be city manager of Carlsbad, who is hosting a, an event to introduce me to her neighbors and talk about my campaign and some of my ideas. So that's gonna be really interesting, especially because she used to be city manager of Carlsbad um, and she's retired now. And then we've got another one coming up October 22nd and that is another coffee chat in the morning. All the other ones are at 5 p.m. 
So the next one in the morning, the coffee chat in the morning, they're always on a Thursday morning at 9 a.m. And that's going to be October 22nd. And this time we've chosen as our topic, um, opportunities for women in leadership. And we're going to talk about running for office. We're going to talk about appointments to commissions. We're going to talk about nonprofit boards uh, that need to be diversified with women. So that's our topic for the 22nd at 9 a.m. So we'll continue to have more coffee chats and more get togethers as hosts uh, come to us and can secure the dates. I know we're in conversation with several other hosts, but sometimes it's hard to like pin down the date and, you know, and get the word out around, um, around the district. So thank you all for being here.